Now, Yvonne is clearly one of my people because according to her profile, she lives in a cave where she hovers over a desk with pen and paper. I love that. Um, she writes furiously every day, or maybe um, she lives in a house and has a keyboard and writes with great concentration and passion. Either way, she's writing. Yvonne brings 20 years of training, experience, and continued study in the field of communication, business development, and marketing for authors, would-be authors, and new small business professionals because, and I love this, write this down, writing a book is a business. Welcome, Yvonne. Hi. Hi. Happy to be here. Um, Jeff, thank you. Thank you for that. Yes, I have my little cave. And my children can attest to that. They they think that I, I live in my office and I never come out. And I have a sign on my door that says, um, enter under penalty of death so that nobody will bother me. Unfortunately, the grandchildren don't seem to care what is on the door. And they just pop their head in and want to be part of everything I do when they're here. And that's fine also. So yes, I am a former print-on-demand publisher. So I started my print-on-demand publishing company before very many people even knew what print-on-demand was. And this is back in the 2005s. Um, and I did it because I published a book that I had a very bad experience with. I didn't like the way I was treated by the publishing company. And I looked at my husband, Tom, who's my partner in everything. And I said, we should start a publishing company because authors shouldn't have to go through this. It shouldn't have to be this difficult. They messed up the interior of my book. They messed up my cover. We had to redo both of those. When it came time to do a press release, okay, so it was 2005. The book was about marketing to women who shop online, all right? It was still kind of new then. Not a lot of people were marketing to women. They, they didn't understand. They were still putting all this marketing out, and they were it was aimed at men. And I wanted to pull them out of the Dick and Jane world of the 1950s, and I wanted them to know that Jane has a purse, and she has money to spend. And so I called the book Dickless Marketing. Well, I can tell you back then, that was quite a stir. And so the publishing company who was supposed to send a press release out for me said, we can't send a press release out for you because it might offend a little old lady in Texas. That I mean, I have that written down. That is what they told me. And I said, okay, then I will send one out. So I created a press release and it said, look, Dick, See Jane, see Jane shop online. And then I talked about the book and it got picked up in a, um, a bunch of places and I got interviewed um, on TV and things like that. And what happened is I didn't take advantage of what I had created because I had created a movement. When that book was published, I started a blog and the blog was called Lipsticking. Lipsticking was the title of the second chapter, and it stood for the fact that I said, if you're going to make promises to women with your lips, it better stick. So the blog became very popular. The blog actually became the number one search re results for marketing to women, marketing to women online in Google for 10 years. And I just did not have the wherewithal to see that I had started this movement and that I could create all these things that we're talking about here. I did go out and speak, but then I just went back into helping other people write and publish books, which I loved, by the way, it was wonderful. And um, in the end, I took a little side trip. So we have to talk about the side trip because the publishing company was doing very well. I had um, more than enough authors coming to me and I was enjoying it, but the blog was doing phenomenal. 
the blog was just tearing up the web and I was getting more and more people contacting me. Women especially were contacting me. They wanted me to teach them how to sell on the internet. So I was asked to speak in Florida and I met the interactive marketing director of Nestle Purina, the pet food company. Okay, so hang in with me. You're going to see how this all fits in. And I said to him, you should be blogging because more women than men have pets. Of course, I was tapped into the women's market very, very deeply and very heavily. And he said, yes, we know that, but we can't blog because the lawyers won't let us. So I said, well, I'll blog for you. I'm a good blogger. And I gave him a proposal. It was more money than I had ever asked anybody to give me before in my life. And he said, accepted and signed on the dotted line. And I became the Perina blogger. Well, here's what happened. There was a large group of pet bloggers out in the world that I didn't know about. One of them contacted me and said, I love that your blog is sponsored by Perina. I'm a PR person and I have a blog called Romeo the Cat. We should do something together. And lo and behold, we got together, my husband, my daughter, myself, Caroline, and we started something called Blog Paws. And Blog Paws took over my life. And we had a conference. And all the big bloggers back in the day to whom I was connected, <clears throat> because I was one of the very first people who understood that you could use your blog to make money, um, they all said, no, you can't do that. You have to create your community, and then you can have a conference. <clears throat> and we all looked at each other and said, well, we don't have a clue how to have a conference, but we're going to have one anyway. And so we went out. And we started putting feelers out saying we were going to have a conference and we had a check in our hand from a sponsor before we even had a bank account. And so all of our conferences going forward were pet friendly. We had Great Danes, we had Chihuahuas, we had ferrets, we had guinea pigs, we had um, somebody brought a capybara once. And all of this happened because we just said, we're going to do it just like the publishing company didn't have a clue how to do a publishing company just said i'm going to do it at that i did go and get a business plan before i started that but what happened is i was in charge of teaching the bloggers how to write better so i was still doing the same thing we were not building books but we were building blogs and i was also in charge of our awards program and getting the speakers for our conferences and it was so popular and so fast that we had to shut down the publishing company. And for 10 years, this is what we did. We ran blog pause. We had these conferences, one on the East Coast, and then a year later, we'd have one on the West Coast. And we're talking all the major pet brands were in attendance. All of the new startups were in attendance. Um, our conferences ran a half a million dollars. Very successful. Then it was bought by a bigger company. And I'm not going to get into all of that, except to say that things just kind of fell apart after this big company took over. They didn't have a clue what to do with these bloggers. And so Tom and I said, you know, let's retire from blog pause and go back to doing books. And so that was seven or eight years ago. And here we are, we're back to doing books. But in the meantime, in the meantime, Amazon took over the, the publishing world. So now we didn't have to have a printer or a distributor. We only had to help the authors write and then get their books off on Amazon, do a book launch. But I was discovering during the first couple of authors I worked with, I was discovering that none of these authors knew how to market themselves. And this just surprised me I just it was like you have this book you have this message let's get it out in front of the people that you want to serve it to and so we started looking into the ways that you can make money 
being an author and all all most of the people I work with are nonfiction business um, owners. Okay, however, make no mistake if you're a fiction author, you still want to make money, and there are still similar ways that you as a fiction author can make money also. So let's talk about some of the ways you can make money. We talk about building webinars and workshops, and absolutely, you should be doing this before this book is published. You should be talking about who is my audience, how do I serve them, and the big question, where do they hang out? Because you have to get your content in front of them where they hang out. This kind of been mentioned a couple other times in this summit. And it's absolutely the biggest, biggest thing. It's one thing to say, so to come to me and say, well, Yvonne, you know, I wrote this really great book. Or I am writing this really great book. Well, I'll say to you, who's it for? Who's your audience? Well, I think my audience is um, business professionals. I'm like, well, isn't that nice? All business professionals everywhere, all of the business professionals in California, all the business professionals across the whole entire country. What about the world? Well, well, no, small business professionals. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. What kind of small business professionals? So we'll go into this deep dive on who the audience is. And one of my favorite places to take my authors both uh, fiction and nonfiction is LinkedIn. Because if you build a community on LinkedIn, and you should be, and I will be teaching you how to build that community while you're writing the book, you have your built-in readers. You will be able to ask for beta readers, which you're going to want. You're going to want to get that feedback from the actual people who are going to read the book. And then you want to, you're going to want to treat your beta readers very nicely. I have a whole program that I teach my authors on how to treat their beta readers properly. Um, LinkedIn is going to help you attract corporations and CEOs and people that are in business who could possibly buy case quantities of your book. And there, the way to do that is, of course, you have to engage these people. You can't just go on LinkedIn and throw your book at me. You can't just put your book up there and say, available on Amazon in October, or I just published my book, available on Amazon. No, we talk about how do you talk about the book, the message, or the story, or whatever it is. How do you entice people to actually want to follow you and engage with you so that they will both buy the book and then come to your workshop or your webinar. Or if you've already been doing them, then that's going to even build your, um, your community bigger. Now, the other big thing that I like my authors to think about is collaboration. Collaboration is a huge, you don't have to necessarily write a book with someone else, but suppose Someone else has written a book that's similar to yours. Why don't you do something together? Now you've got two networks, your network and their network. If you want to do a collaboration with another author, and my husband is at this moment collaborating with someone that we met in a networking group and they're writing a book together, that is a very good way to build your community out also. Um, we want our authors to do that. Um, I want my authors to be as visible, especially on LinkedIn, but, but not just LinkedIn. Okay, so Instagram is another good place to be. But Instagram, you're going to want to make videos and reels. I, I am not the person to teach people how to do that, but I know someone who is. And TikTok. TikTok has become one of the best places to promote your book because you can do these little short videos where you talk about chapter two and what's important on chapter two. You can talk about a character. You can introduce the backstories of characters that maybe weren't in the book. And by the way, even nonfiction books have characters. 
because the people that you're writing about are the characters in the book, even if they're real live people. All right. So you want to use the tools that are available to you. And I'm telling you that TikTok, Instagram, and LinkedIn are the ones that I recommend the most. Do you have to be on all three? Not really. You can pick two, but you should be on at least two of them. And you should practice using them and you should go out of your way to engage with the people then who follow you and leave comments. Do not ever leave a comment unanswered. LinkedIn and um, all of these other platforms will tell you when someone has commented on your work. You must go in then and respond to them. There are tools that um, you can use to help you with some of the posting, some AI tools. Um, one of them is called evai.io. So evyai.io. And that will actually help you craft the messages you want to share on LinkedIn or anywhere else. It can help craft your about page. It can help craft any of the kind of content that um, you just don't really have time. You're busy. You're going to either be writing your book or working with clients or building your next webinar, having a summit or something like that. So using AI is not a bad thing. You just have to use it correctly. And remember this, okay? AI takes all of its content from the internet. So it's going out on the internet and it brings back a whole lot of garbage. You must double check any facts or any figures or anything that AI delivers to you and says that has a link in it. You must double check Tom, my husband, who's a recovering lawyer in his previous life, he was a lawyer. He can tell you about a, um, a lawyer not so long ago, a few months ago, who used AI to create his legal case. And he took it to court with him and none of the citations that were in it existed in the real world. None of the links that he presented as part of his case um, were, were actually real links that went somewhere. So please don't trust AI. Please double check it. You We freeze. Oh, it's frozen. You, you're back. Am I back? You are back. Can you hear us okay? I can. I can. Where did I, where did you lose me? <laughs> you were talking about the lawyer. Yeah, the, the lawyer. <laughs> the lawyer who, I don't think he's a lawyer anymore. I don't know if he lost his license. I, think he I can't remember. Have. But you, you would think, right? The judge was not pleased. Um, yeah, so I'm just cautioning you. Use AI as the tool that it's meant to be. There are specific ways, by the way, that you can put a prompt into AI. Don't just go to AI and say, um, I am the author of this book. Can you write my about page on my website? So Nancy, you could have someone um, go in and the prompt would be Speaking as an expert in a specific, whatever it is, whatever discipline or book or story, speaking as an expert in, um, and then give it some more information about the person, and then say, build me an about page for a website. It will build you the about page. Now, you probably will go in and change a fair amount of that, but it's going to return something just like that. So now you've got a template to work with. Now you've got something that you didn't have to sit there, like Jeff was saying, um, uh, being scared about that blank page in front of you because AI is going to fill that blank page up with a whole bunch of stuff. You just have to be very, very specific. You have to give it very specific instructions. I have often said, um, speaking as a marketing expert, Give me 10 things that a, a book author could do before they publish their book to market their book. And it will give me 
10 things. And then I will say, now refine that down to the five most important things that an author needs to do. And then it will go down to the five things. So then what I do is I take all of that. I take the 10 things and the five things and I say, what do I want to use here? What is useful to me and how can I put it in my own words? Um, so AI is not going to, by the way, take over uh, writing. You don't have to worry about it, writing your books. Yes, there are going to be books written by AI, but let's face it. Artificial intelligence has never held a baby. It's never walked on a beach. It's never um, cried over a broken love affair. So it cannot today emulate the kind of emotions that go along with that kind of thing. So in the last couple months, a couple of people that I'm connected to on LinkedIn, um, and these are people, one of them is someone who does exactly what I do. And I was on her podcast earlier this week and, and we just had the best time. We just talked and laughed and shared stories. Um, I, I have no problem with other people who do the same thing I do and you know, exchanging information. But she did something really interesting with her book launch that I think is worth sharing here. And she created a networking, an in-person networking event out of her book launch. It wasn't a book signing. It wasn't a come and see, I'm gonna read from my book and then my friend here is gonna read the part that he liked, it wasn't that. She had an actual event where she held it, I think, at a hotel. So yes, she spent a little bit of money and she had everyone that she knew come and she turned it into an actual networking event. It was wonderful. She posted um, videos of it online. It was absolutely marvelous. I thought it was genius. What you do is you now you have all these people in there and they're going to meet each other. They're there as a business networking group. But oh, by the way, and here is her book. You know, they're going to go now and talk about her book, right? They're going to buy her book. So, um, and another person that is a PR professional, she is creating something that she calls her love wall. So every time someone buys her book and takes a picture of themselves with her book, which I did just recently, and I don't have it right next to me right now. But anyway, um, she creates a wall of all these pictures of the person in the book. So she has like 25 pictures and she puts it up on LinkedIn and she thanks each one of them specifically individually for buying her book and being part of her community. And everybody gets to see their picture on LinkedIn and it's all this wonderful and everybody comes and leaves comments. And by the way, the more comments you get on LinkedIn, the more LinkedIn likes you. So that was another thing that I thought was pretty genius that she went out of her way um, to thank her community, the community that she had fostered while she was writing this book. Um, in the end, uh, you know, open it up to questions, but I want to say kind of what Jeff has been saying, what Janine has been saying, you want to give your community whatever it is they want. So what do they want? Find out what they want, ask them. This is the this is the big thing. Is it just not hard to figure out? Just either ask them on LinkedIn. You know, I uh, I'm putting this out there to my LinkedIn community. Would you like me to create a webinar about X Y Z? Um, do a poll. Do do a reach out through email if you have an email list. Tap into the things that your community wants from you. Because I promise you, if you're writing a nonfiction book, if, if your book is educational or um, something to teach me or inspire me or whatever, then I want a piece of you. I don't just want this book. And so, yes, create supplemental materials, create resources that you can share on your website. So what we do in our books is throughout the books, um, my authors have a QR code where people can get additional resources for that chapter that are either workbook-like <clears throat> or will help them because it's educational. Um, and when you do that, 
then you create more interest in whatever it is that your, your message, your book, your purpose, and then you get to ask them, would you like me to do a webinar? Would you come to an in-person workshop? By the way, you can do a webinar and a workshop and they can be the same. So you can do the webinar online and then you can turn it into a workshop. Today, there's no reason you can't do that. You should be doing something like that. You can turn it into a small group meeting. By the way, a big, big thing that, that I haven't heard talked about here yet are um, book clubs. Brandon, I'm gonna put a name out here for you. Brandon Sanderson. He's a sci-fi writer, okay? But it doesn't matter. I want you to go to Brandon, B-R-A-D-O-N, Sanderson, his site, and you will see the amazing things that he's doing to engage with his community and to get, um, so he started his own book club and they do videos and he shares and he comes on and speaks with them. And this leads me to the last thing that I want to say. And it is that at Master Book Builders, we have something that we call the Taylor Swift model of book marketing. And we call it that because Taylor Swift is a genius marketer. You know, her Swifties, they would lay down in front of a truck for her. Why? Why? Because she sends them gifts. She calls them out by name at, at concerts. She makes an effort to be part of their lives. And she is just doing everything she can to make sure they get the albums on time, that they get to see some, some of the um, sneak previews of whatever it is she's working on. This is what you need to do as an author. These are the kinds of things that you need to be concentrating on. The Taylor, so we, if you want a copy of our Taylor Swift um, um, model of book marketing, I'm happy to provide it to, to folks. But um, this is our big thing now is we want people to understand that it's not about you. It's not about your book. It's about the reader. It's about the message. It's about what is the reader going to achieve or get? What, what problem are you solving? What solution are you giving? And in the end, Exactly what do you want them to do after they read your book? Because if they just read your book and then put it on the shelf or put it over there, that is no good. How does that help you? So you should have your call to action in several places in the book. Again, the QR codes are good for the resources, but they're also good for the call to action. What is the call to action? What do you want them to do? You want them to join your community. You want them to sign up your, for your webinar. You want them to become part of your subscription model. What is it you want them to do? You have to tell them. I mean, I'll just go right on. You have to tell them. They won't do it if you don't tell them. You literally have to say, okay, reader, now go here and do this. And when you're done doing that, write me an email. Whatever it is, you literally have to tell them because they won't do it if you don't tell them. So <laughs> there you go. Any questions? I have regrets in life. My big regret is I didn't let you go first because I would have given you way more of my time because you're just... You and I are clearly uh, kindred spirits. So does anybody have any questions for Yvonne? Um, I can't stress enough. I'm going to underline, punctuate, exclamation, build that community. And, and I love the Taylor Swift reference because, I mean, literally those people, God help you if you insult Taylor publicly. Uh, Let me say something about that, um, Jeff. One of the things that we did, and the reason we did it, and we're calling it the Taylor Swift method is, why are we doing that? Because she's in the news all the time, because everybody knows who she is. So every time you have a chance to write about something that's relevant to your topic, your message, that's in the news, oh, you need to do that. You need to connect them. You need to get people seeing that, oh, by the way, this is what I've been talking about. And here they are over here. They're talking about on CNN. 
I love that. Any questions? Uh, I think Tasha is going to reach out and pull us back. Um, Yvonne, that was brilliant. Thank you. And please reach out to me. I want you on my podcast. My people need to meet you. So thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Lynette. Um, any comments? Because uh, I think uh, we're going to get pulled in like any second. Um, Chris, did you have a question or comment? Yeah, oh, that was very informative, Yvonne. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm I'm in the process of launching books right now, um, and they're different. One's a children's book and one's poetry. And yet the connection with them is a sense of belonging. <laughs> kind of all my books are kind of, that's the underlying theme. And the children's book actually can be marketed as an SEL book. Um, and I'm in the process of just trying to figure out, okay, how to get that in libraries, in schools, in, you know, yeah. really getting it into hands because I think it's a book that that has a, a place right now. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I'm doing kind of a marketing campaign right now, but I don't. Well, let you me know. give you one one piece of advice for the library. If, if you can go to um, any of the public libraries or all of them within a driving distance of where you mm -hmm. are, and offer your book to them and they accept it to put on the shelf and then you yeah. come back in a few weeks and say you know did people read it just kind of follow up on it and then you can ask them to put it in their database oh okay yeah they'll well, they're all you have to put it in their prove, libraries they like yeah, the book. you have to prove that people are going to read it um and that's number one um number two you can do, do that also with barnes and noble by the way so you can get your books into your local Barnes and Noble store, and you can actually do book signings at Barnes and Noble. You can talk to them about maybe collaborating. Maybe there's other indie authors in the area, and you can do an event. And um, you probably will have to talk to the major, to the uh, person who's running, because Barnes and Noble recently, I don't know how many know this, Barnes and Noble switched from, to, from it is still a franchise model, but the individual franchisees have more control now over how their store looks, what books they sell. And the CEO of Barnes and Noble said on, on camera a few months ago that they changed the way they do things because the in the old model, the old Barnes and Noble way that they did things, 70% of the books were returned to the publisher, 70%. And they don't do that anymore. So that was one of the re th reasons indie books were not getting into Barnes and Noble because we don't take returns. We, you know, if if we put five books there, five books are there. We're not taking them back. I mean, so it's much easier now to do it because they don't they don't adhere to that anymore. Okay. <clears throat> One more question. Thank you. Comments. Thank you. Um, yeah. Go ahead, I have Chris. another question. Um, how about reviews? Um, how important are they? And uh, particularly industry reviews. And, you know, I did request reviews on, on the children's book, but, <clears throat> you know, uh, I, I think I sent out like five or six um, emails or books for review. Um, how many do so, you need? So Amazon prefers that you have at least 50. And they prefer that you have 100. Mm -hmm. How do you get these? There are places that will do reviews that are accepted by Amazon. So I have a list of those places. If you if you connect with me, I'm happy to send you both um, um, the places to get your book reviewed, you can pick and choose. You will have to pay a fee for some of them. I will also send you places to send your book for awards. We are very big on asking our authors to send their books into these places to win awards. You can win an award for the cover, the entire book or whatever. So I will ha happily send that. And then I have another little document of other places to sell your book besides Amazon. Okay. Yeah. 
Well, I'm I'm working with Amazon Direct right now. They have a marketing program. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that? I have not used it. I have not used it. Um, generally, because we do what you've been describing, we do that with our authors. So we haven't looked yeah. into the Amazon um, program. But I'm glad to hear that you're doing it. I'm glad to hear that it, it, it is, work well, I assume it's working for you. Maybe you just started your Well, we haven't done the official launch, but I mean, mm -hmm. they guarantee 500 books sold within three or four months or your oh. money back. Okay, okay, because <clears throat> the average author sells 250 books. So 500 books is pretty good. Well, I have three books out too. So it's really launching all three books. So it's it's been quite a bit of work for me, but oh, I, bet. I think it's going to pay off. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so they will get some reviews for me. They're doing social media. Um, they're writing press releases, um, articles, mm -hmm. and they're doing a list of blog do posts. You, so do you have a website? I do. I'm well, I, I have a website and I'm getting an author website kind of it's under construction. Okay. So you yeah, have a blog. you're going to have a blog. They're going to write. I, have, I have a blog. Yeah. 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 That's, I mean, one of the other things that um, I didn't mention too much gift um, gift guides. Okay. So bloggers especially do gift guides and you can find bloggers that do book reviews and bloggers that do gift guides just by going to Google and searching Google plus gift guides bloggers but then you have to put children's books or whatever your genre is because you want to be specific on what google's going to return to you um the other thing is readsy r-e-e-d-s-y is um a place to go they have a whole list of bloggers that do book reviews uh so you might want to look at that also but okay. gift guides are, are all year long. It's not just Christmas. And what bloggers do is, is they'll ask you to send them either a PDF or a print copy of the book. And then they're going to put it in their gift guide and all of the people that come to the blog.